Hey, I'm Russ Gifford. Welcome back to Session 8. We're going to look at more fire lanes now. Remember last uh, time out we looked at how to make a, a fire lane? It's very simple, right? The unit moves out in front of you, you fire at it, and you declare a fire lane before you shoot. That way, even if you shoot with the squad, you go ahead and say, I'm going to fire on to the, the length of my, uh, my range, or the first blocking object, whichever comes first. Now the thing was, last time, we stated there were certain things about fire lanes, right? It has to be on the same level, or if you are at a higher level, it would have to be a hill where you had a continuous slope going down. That's the only way. It's either on the same level or a continuous slope. So if I'm in level one of a building, I can't lay down a fire lane, correct? Okay, good. Now, number two. We also said your machine gun had to be good order. What does that mean? Good order is pretty simple, right? It can't be broken, meaning malfunctioned. Nor can it be what? Under ammo shortage. And we get ammo shortage as a special scenario rule um, most often. Uh, it will show up in, spe in the SSRs in the scenario saying, the Russians have ammo shortage. We see that in ASL-1, the very first one, I believe. Uh, you know, the Russians can't lay down a fire lane with their machine gun. So, those are, are the basic items. Now, the last time, though, I said we just fired straight down the hex grain, right? Well, this time we're going to see how you would do it with an alternate hex grain. And in reality, this is not just fire lanes. We're going to set up a little piece of a scenario situation, and we're going to play it out. That's how we're going to do this. And in the process, we're going to learn how alternating hex rows, alternating hex grains work. Are you ready? So the goal for this session, learn how alternate hex grain fire lanes work. We're also going to see the impact of smoke. And then in the process, we're going to play this out, so we might as well see some other realities. Well, maybe a dash is a way you can get across the street when you're faced with a fire lane. I'm not necessarily recommending it, but I'm going to show you how a dash works so that you can see how that happens. And then, since you're going to have those wonderful minuses happening to you, it's very easy to get down to a situation where you have a casualty reduction on a unit. So we're going to talk about casualty reduction. And then just in an offhand way, very quickly, we're going to talk about building control. Because most of the scenarios that are fixed point scenarios, uh, defensive scenarios, will end up revolving around building control. So we've got a lot of things going on in this one. I'm still going to try and hold it down to a reasonable amount of time. But we're going to do this one differently. It's going to be multiple pieces. It's going to be a quiz every step of the way because many of these things you should already know. We talked about them in the last one. And we're just going to apply them to a real life example. Are you ready? So here we are. We're ready for examples of fire lanes. It's the American last turn and they have to control building X3. Now we know it's building X3. We just find the one that has the X3 in it. That refers to that building. There's no special scenario rule here. And most of you will, will probably recognize this off of board one. It could be happening in a, in a scenario you've played. But here's the, the situation. It's the Americans' last turn. They, they get the last move. And they have to control building X3. They happen to know that under those light machine guns are two, four, six, seven German squads. They're both in the building. They're both on the ground floor. Yuck. Yuck. So the Americans have a few squads. They got a four to two advantage, but they have to get in the building. And to be able to control the building, what do they have to do? So we're going to, and, and what I'm really trying to do is teach you how to, to analyze your scenario situations. If the victory condition said that they have to control that building, the only way they can win is to be the only units in that building. They, uh, because there's no way right now that they could possibly be the last to occupy every location. Now, notice it doesn't say only good order units. It says only units. 
So the only way they're going to win is if at the end of this game turn, those two German units no longer exist. Broken doesn't count, because if they break and they run upstairs, they're going to make it. They will control it. And that does give you kind of a hint as to why the Americans really could just toss in the, the towel here. But they're plucky. They're going to try. So to win, they have to control the building. The only way they can control this building, since they can't occupy every location and they're not in a position to mop up, they have to be the last good order units, the, the last units in the building to solely occupy it. So now our analysis tells us shooting won't do it. If they break the Germans, the Germans will just run away, they'll still be in the building, and we won't be able to claim last to solely occupy. So here's the solution. They're going to try to move into the building, and they're going to try to close combat the defenders. Woohoo! Bring it on! So here's the way the building control reads. If the Americans are the only armed good order infantry multi-man counter in the building at game end, and there are no longer any armed enemy ground units in the building, in other words, they could be broken, Americans could win. So it's a slim chance. Here we go. So if the Americans prep fire, they can't move. If they can't move, we've already said they can't win, right? So they are going to pass on prep fire. They're heading straight to movement. When do fire lanes happen? During the movement phase, don't they? When the Americans start to move, if they move to a location that we could place a fire lane, boom, we got them, correct? Well, but unfortunately, it doesn't look... I, I don't see how I can really set up a good fire lane here, can I? I mean, it's not like last time where we're shooting down a straight grain. If I were... It, I just don't see it. Well, now you're going to learn the alternate hex grain fire lane. Can my light machine guns do a fire lane? Sure they can. Are they under ammo shortage? No. Are they malfunctioned? No. So they can do fire lanes, can't they? So, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but we do know that there are two full squads and two light machine guns out there, so the Americans are going to try and push it. Now, what I'm suggesting here is not necessarily a good answer. It's just an answer. This is just a examples, right? So the squad that was in AA5 is going to attempt to dash across the street to Y4. What the heck is a dash? Have you heard about a dash? Do you know anything about dashes? It's a, it's a form of movement, isn't it? It's a very risky form of, un, of movement. Here's the way a dash works. It will decrease any fire at the unit by half, but it's going to still subject them to all the relevant die roll modifiers that occur at the time of the attack. So in other words, he's dashing across an open street. He's not assault moving, he's dashing. It's just the opposite of assault moving, right? where an assault move only moves you one hex, dash is taking it completely across there, and he's got to be subject to those die roll modifiers. If the unit survives to make it, it'll make it into Y4. But if he's pinned or broken, he's going to stay in the hex where he was shot at. And what we're going to see is that the German's going to shoot at him at the, at the best location. Now the German could shoot somewhere else. He could shoot at him after he hits Y4. But if he shoots at him in Y4 when he comes adjacent, the German will be doubled, but a couple of other things happen. The American would get the building terrain, so it would be doubled. It would be 4 and 3 is 7, doubled 14, so it would be a 12-column attack, but it would be a plus 2, wouldn't it? Yeah, so that's kind of tough. And he wants to really break these 747s. But if we look at it the other way, if he shoots at him out on the street in Z4, in that case, he actually is going to get his 7 minus 2. And if you think of each minus as moving up a column, that would move us from a 6 to an 8 and from an 8 to a 12. So in reality, he's getting the same equivalent as though he were shooting at him 
and he's actually doing better because a plus could be considered to go down. The 12 would be the same as a straight, what, six shot. So it's, you know, it's looking pretty good. He's going to fire at him as he crosses the street, but he wants to do more than that. He wants to declare a fire lane at the same time. And you can see that yellow bar, how it's going straight down the spine to hit Z4. Well, that means he is going to be able to declare a fire lane using the alternate hex grain. That's a fire lane that's declared when uh, it goes through a series of connected hexes, but not down the main grain. And we're going to see here how that looks. Ready? So, remember the initial attack that creates the fire lane can include the other combat units stacked with the MG and any squads or leaders. Now, this, this is dicey because the German doesn't have a leader, does he? So he could what? He could cower. So in reality, there's a 1 in 6 chance he could cower. And there's a 1 in 12 chance, uh, 1 in 36 chance he could break the machine gun. So, hey, you got chances here. Now, by doing this, the additional squad's firepower will leave a separate residual. He gets a bigger attack on the first attack, but that residual is separate. And later fire lane residuals then, when we just step into the fire lane, won't include the squad's firepower. That squad's firepower residual will sit in the hex where he shot. The fire lane will go all along the chosen path, but the squad's fire, uh, the squad's remaining uh, residual will stay in the hex where he shot the, the unit. So, here's the attack. It's a 4 plus 3 is a 7, and it's times a half because it's a dash. It takes it down to 3 and a half points. That's still, what's he get for, we said he had to take all the modifiers. He's in clear terrain, so he's moving in the open. It's not an assault move, so he loses that one too. Oak and ugly. So there is no 3.5, it's down to a 2. And, though, it's a 2 minus 2. That means even if he rolls an 8, he gets a result, doesn't he? And, you know, anytime there are negatives, it can move you into that K or, or KIA or K slash area. That means negatives are literally potential killers. Well, and he rolled a 4, a 1-3. So, 1-3 is a 4. With the minus 2, it becomes a 2, which, if we look at the chart, is a K slash 1. And we'll see it again here. K slash 1. What the heck is a K slash 1? There it is on this chart. See how it started at a 4, went down 2 to a K slash 1? Bingo, they didn't cower, they didn't break their machine gun. They got rate of fire, but did they get rate of fire? No. Because why? Because they de declared a fire lane. So it's a K slash 1. Well, K slash 1 says it's been casualty reduced. That means if it's a squad, you replace it with a half squad of the same quality. So these were elites. It goes down to a half squad of an elite. And... If it was already a half squad, a K would eliminate it. If it had been a leader, the K would have wounded it. And then the leader would have had to take a wound severity roll to see if he lived. Now, in this case, it was a full squad, so it becomes a half squad. But here's the trick. That number that was after it, that's a morale check number. So that half squad now has to take a one morale check, doesn't it? The attack result, if we replace it with a 337, there he is. And now he takes the die roll, and it's a one check. There's the dice, rolls a five, one check. We add one, becomes a six. That's a pass, isn't it? So that means moves into the building. He goes ahead and completes the dash. He'd only spent those points. Now, 
we've got to decide what happens. He said there was going to be a fire lane. He has to declare how that fire lane's going to work. But the American made it into the building. That's number one. But we have to place the fire lane residual. And notice here, because this is the edge of the board, we're setting the one fire lane. Because remember, how do we decide what kind of a fire lane you get? You take whatever the column is that the, that the machine gun fires on, and you take the next column down to the left, and that's the residual that's left, right? So in this case, a 3.8 is going to fire on the two column, so it has a one residual. And now we see there's one residual. The extreme extent of this is in AA6, and that's going to leave residual of 1 in Z4. We know that, but where do the others go? What happens with the other side? Let's take a look. There's that 1 being placed. As long as the attack does not break the machine gun, it's got to place the fire lane. And he's placing it from where he is to AA6. And we talked about the calculation for the first column to the left, or whatever the normal is. But this fire lane follows the spine, so the firer has to decide which half does he want. Z4 and AA6 are definite. They get their full hexes that we're hitting. But he has to choose whether he's going to go consistently to the left of the hex or consistently to the right of the hex to place the other part of the residual. I think I graphically show that here. So there it is one way. So if it were to the left side for the German, he'd be saying, I want him in those hexes. If he goes to the right side, he's going to get him in these hexes. That makes sense? So that's pretty clear, isn't it? That's because it's an alternate hex row, but he's got to declare which hexes it's going to hit, left or right of the lane. Now, by the way, if the first hex you hit happened to be left or right of the lane, you'd have to choose that side. So if he'd wanted to do this and he would have been firing at Z3, then he would have chosen... Z3, Z4, AA5, AA6, right? But in this case, he's going to do that anyway because the building in Y4 could block Z5 for him, and he wants to make sure he's covering Z5, doesn't he? Okay. So we know there's a one residual now in Z3, Z4, AA5, and AA6. But we only place the one in AA6, and then we have to remember the TEMs count. I'm going to put those in so you see what I'm talking about. There's a building in AA5, and remember, these are only going to be triggered. If I had somebody sitting in one of those hexes right now, it would not impact them at all, would it? Because they're not moving. This all fire lanes only affect moving units. So... Uh, that's why in the last example we used last session, I didn't really mention it, but we were firing through those other two units that had gotten fired at the first time by the fire lane. Didn't affect them again because they're no longer moving units. We're, we're, we're attacking in the movement phase. We only affect moving units. So there's one residual in each of these, but remember it's still going to give them the pertinent modifiers. Modifiers might be die roll modifiers, and they might be distant modifiers. So in other words, remember, even though I have a one fire lane marker in Z3, if somebody moves into that, that's a doubled hex, isn't it? Because it's adjacent to the LMG, isn't it? Here we go. Let's keep going. He gets his first fire. Those others, that was just there to show you. But we also have to remember the squad fired with him, and that's why the first fire marker is on both units. Squad fired with him, so we have to put his original uh, uh, in Z4. Now, 
might have this wrong because under a dash, uh, he may have hit him with less. And this is where you would turn to your rule book and you'd say, well, hey, wait a minute, show me what happens with a dash. You know, and we would just simply look up dash. And the easiest way to do that, I always put my index in the front of the book. That way it's easy to get to. I don't know if they still come that way. In the old days, the index was in the back, and that always struck me as crazy. So we know that dash is A4.63. That makes it easy. So we just go to 4.63, and we say under dash that something happens. Now, with a dash, when he tries it, Well, so, we would look to find out what it would do for anything else. He may not have expended any other movement phase, blah, 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 this and that. You know, so it can only be a two-hex move, has to get through it, you know, unless he's wounded in the road. Uh, so, but we would just go through and we have ourselves our dash marker and we see we also have our residual and now we know that if we move into any of these hexes we're going to end up with some residual attacks that happen to us during movement. But the American made it that far now, the problem is the German is next to him with a first fire marker. He's only a half squad, but we got a first fire. He's set. We know what's going to happen next. We've got to get in the building. We've got more movement to do. Now, I ask you, this is a quiz. If the unit entered Z3, what firepower would the fire lane attack with? And because it's adjacent to the firer's location, what happens? It's point blank, so that would be doubled, so that one firepower fire lane would attack with two firepower and any die roll modifiers that would apply. And why did we put the additional residual in Z4? That's residual left from the squad firing the machine gun. The squad that was firing, not the machine gun's fire. So now, if the unit in AA4 steps into Z3, what would it be attacked with? It could be attacked with what? Could actually get attacked with the one doubled to two for the residual, and that would make it a two, and then it would depend on whether he assault moved or whether he... Um, just tried to move in there normally. If he moved into Z4, the way it would work is first he would take the, the residual attack and then he would take the fire lane attack. Now I might have that wrong. How would I look to check that? I'd go back to the book and I know that fire lanes are under 9 point something and we've got residual firepower treated as residual under 9.222, right? Fire lane residual firepower cannot be used to increase the size of residual firepower from other cho any other source. Where they intersect, each firepower residual is resolved separately, it says. And if residual firepower from a source other than the fire lane exists in a location, it must be resolved separately. All right? So it gets, it gets resolved by itself. All right? Okay, so that gives us a hint with that. So we said in that if it were in Z3, he'd get attacked. Yeah, so, and if a unit moves into Z4, it's going to be attacked by how much residual? First it'll check for the residual, then it's going to get the 2, right? And what die roll modifiers will the residual attacks have? Depends on how the target moves, doesn't it? 
It's a non-assault move, they're going to get a minus 2 die roll modifier. If they assault move, only a minus 1. And if they moved into AA5, they could get a plus 2 because that's the building if they were non-assault moving. They'd get the plus 3 TM minus the 1 first fire non-assault. So it'd only be a plus 2. We can see it's a tough cookie because we've already seen with the last die roll that any minus can kill you. But we've got to get across the street. We've got to get there, right? And we can also guess that the machine gun in X5 is also planning a fire lane as well, isn't he? Yeah, now that we've seen one trick and how well it's holding us up, we can see he's probably going to do the same thing. So, what can we do to get rid of the minus one first fire from moving in the open? We've only got one choice, and that's if we could have a hindrance. Well, Americans, unlike the Russians we played with last time, have a chance for hindrances. They bring them with them. They're called smoke grenades. Smoke Squads can place smoke in their own hex or an adjacent location if they're equipped with smoke grenades and if they roll low enough. So the smoke exponent here is 3. Now, smoke placement is a movement and it costs movement factors. If you're placing it in the same location you're in, the smoke grenade costs plus one, uh, or excuse me, is one movement factor. If you're trying to put it in an adjacent location, it's gonna cost you two. Now the problem with that is, then we run into some other issues too, because your fire factors, how do I wanna put this? The thing that triggers defensive fire is movement, right? And specifically movement factor use. So even though you don't move from a location to another location, just the attempt to get a smoke grenade could cause you to be shot at in defensive fire. So the way it works, the squad's gonna designate the hex they want, they're gonna pay the movement factors, and then they roll one die. If the die roll is less than or equal to the smoke exponent, the smoke is placed. If the die roll is equal to 6, the unit ends its move. So in other words, in our case, 1, 2, or 3, he gets the smoke. 4, 5, he doesn't get the smoke, but no problems. 6, he doesn't get to expend any more movement points. Now he's not pinned. It does not say pinned, it just says he has to end his move. So there's some risk here, isn't there? But it is a 50-50 chance to play smoke, and those are pretty good odds. In fact, those are the best odds you can get in ASL for a unit, a squad, placing smoke. So let's see how we can use this. Let's also remember there's such a thing called assault movement. And we have to remember that an assault movement's when your unit's crawling on their belly, moving very carefully to avoid drawing fire. You know, they, you know, they, whether they're moving carefully, crawling, it's your interpretation. But the game terms, they can only change one location, and they cannot use all of their non-CX movement factors. Now that's normally four, right? So they can't use all four points and still declare it an assault move. And the thing that reduces your movement fa factor capability is if you're carrying too many things, like machine guns. Not a problem for these Americans, but something to keep in mind. So it's the next American move. Remember, there is residual um, up there in Z3, Z4, but not in Z5 yet, right? So, we want to get out in the street. If we assault move, we don't get the minus one non-assault moving. But we still get the minus one moving in the open, unless we could get smoke out there. So let's see how we can do this. So the assault movement, there are the rewards that I just mentioned. Fired on, they don't pay the minus one non-assault movement. And if an open ground, they don't pay the minus one uh, moving in open if they had smoke. But assault movement, you'll pay the minus one 
if you're moving in open. Now if you're concealed and you're not in open ground, you'll remain concealed as well if you are assault moving. So you might be there might be something to think about. Assault movement is key. Assault movement and cover are the key things to keeping your concealment and moving closer to an enemy unit. So let's give it a try. We're down in the units in Z6. One of those squads in Z6 is going to try for smoke in Y6. Now notice he is not declaring an assault move. He rolls a die roll of two. Yes, he does. So that means what? He gets smoke, and he's placing it where he said he was going to try for it, which is Y6. And there's the smoke. Smoke is inherent. It means it goes from hex side to hex side. So even looking straight down the Y6, Y5 hex side, that German squad is going to have to pay the... the, the uh, hindrance effect for the smoke. Woohoo! That's huge! And now the movement unit moves into Y6. He jumps right under the smoke. Now, why didn't the assault move? Because it cost him. He can't because he spent four movement points. It was two to try for the smoke and it was two to move into any hex. It's an extra plus one to move into any hex that has smoke, so that makes it two. So that's four. He can't make it as a, an assault move. So, but in this case, he's no longer moving in the open, is he? Because the smoke is a hindrance. Now the 467 with the machine gun in X5 is going to declare its shot at that moving unit, but he's also going to declare a fire lane. But even though he could fire down that grain straight at it, he wants to fire at him, but he wants to fire down so that he covers Z5. Just like that. See how that works? So he's got the 4 for the squad, the 3 for the machine gun. They're doubled to 7. They're doubled for point blank, gets them to 14. They play a plus 2 for the smoke TEM, but they get a minus one for non-assault movement. So he's going to take a 12 plus one. Ouch. But you don't win the game sitting in the hex he's in. Now by declaring the alternate fire lane, the unit is going to cover that hole in Z5, isn't he? It's not much, but it's all he's got because if he had fired at the unit adjacent to him without declaring the fire lane, if he gets a first fire marker, he can't fire any farther than the unit that's closest to him, can he? So his result, we said, was a 12 plus 1. There's that 7 on the 12 column. 7 plus 1 is an, goes to a 1 morale check. Well, you know, really, that's about the best that American could hope for. One morale check. Just notice we've got our our fire lane declared. Here's the die roll. Yes, it's a five plus one is six. It's a full squad. It's a seven four seven. So he what? He passed. Yes. Now he spent four movement points. He can't go any farther. We place the fire lane marker. We're going to get that first fire marker. There we go. And now the smoke makes a big difference. Since smoke is inherent, so even though the line of sight only goes along the hex side, the plus 2 TM is going to negate the minus 1 moving in the open when the next squad moves. Is that cool or what? So, now, we know where this hex grain works, don't we? He can't choose to have the fire lane go through Y5, Z5, AA5 because he didn't shoot at Y5. He shot at Y6. Y6 then, he's got to always stay to that side. So his fire lane is going to go through Y6, Z5, 
AA6, BB5, CC6, DD5, and EE6. Now, for the most part, <laughs> those are all really academic because all the action is happening right here, isn't it? So, now, the 80 and his 747 has a choice to make, and the key issue there is going to be how lucky do I feel? Because he could climb on top of the smoke, but the problem with that is, since all those are marked as first fire, at the end of the movement phase, the smoke goes away, and the LMG and the, mach and the full squad would get final fire, wouldn't they? That would be kind of ugly. Okay, So, he decides he's going to try something different. They're going to just regularly move to Z5. Now remember, the fire lane from the top unit doesn't go through Z5. The only fire lane that does is the one with the machine gun, and it goes along the smoke. So, it's one movement factor. What's the attack? Can you figure it out? He still gets the full residual of one, but the die roll modifier is now going to be different. It took away the minus one moving in the open, and he's now still going to get the minus one non-assault. But the smoke TM does not count. So it's still one firepower minus one, and you know, that can really ruin your day. So let's see what happens. Had he assault moved, he would have had a zero die roll modifier, but then he'd be too far away to make a difference. In the end, he has to be in position to get into close combat to win. So he's taking the chance. He gets a one firepower minus one on the die roll. Rolls a seven, which becomes a six. A six on the five is a miss. Excuse me, a six on the one is a miss. And since he did not assault move, he's still free to move, and he moves into the building for two more. Now, should the German final fire? The question was, should the German subsequent first fire? Final fire happens later. But subsequent first fire, in other words, while he's still moving, should he fire? Well, he can subsequent first fire the squad. But it'll only be the squad, because once you declare a fire lane, it cannot be canceled unless somebody is trying to move into the hex with the machine gun. In other words, if a berserker is coming in, if a... Uh, a uh, uh, cavalry unit is coming in, because they're the only ones that can enter a hex. Other than that, it would have to be some sort of armored vehicle trying to enter the hex with the machine gun. In that case, they can cancel their fire lane and try to redirect. But still, the fire lane is more valuable to them anyway. And there's the chance that when you subsequent first fire the squad, remember, they could end up cowering and, and have even worse trouble. The 4 plus a 2 die roll modifier, because they're going to get the building, um, is not great odds. They'd be better off waiting until the movement phase, um, when the smoke goes away at the end of the movement phase. At the end of the movement phase, they could then declare final fire, because they only have a first fire marker on them, and flip it over and take the uh, fire with the machine gun, and try to get rid of that squad that's out in the street, you know, and at least cut it, cut the odds down somewhat. So, those are big things and things they need to think about. So, now, the last unit, the unit in A4. Now, the truth is, if this were a real game, he would probably go AA3 because there's nobody that can attack him there, and then he would go to Z2, daring the squad to final fire, and that would be a lot. Four halved and doubled, and then with the minus two. So he's thinking, really, I just have to be adjacent 
I want to assault move, and I'm doing the assault move into Z3, so I only get a minus 1. And that minus 1, then, what's the attack, though? Why didn't he try for smoke? If he got a 6, the move's over, and he's out of range. He can't advance into the close combat. The 1 firepower residual is doubled for point blank. So with a 1 minus for moving in the open, it's 2 minus 1. 7. Ah. On the 2 firepower, a minus 1. 7 minus 1 is a 6. 6 is a pin task check. And if the American rolls a 7, it's a pass, isn't it? Now, there's lots of action left with the movement over, the smoke go, and the residuals all go away. The German could use final fire versus the adjacent units in the street with a chance to break them. When they don't get it, because it's not a great chance. The big thing is, he has to do it to climb into close combat, but the truth is, what's going to happen right before close combat? We're going to have the route phase. Could the German choose to route and route upstairs or route away in the building? He can. There's no way the Americans can actually win this, can they? Not if the German is smart. But the big point is we saw that at least we have chances to try because if our opponent doesn't realize he needs to break and run, uh, at least... We learned how to not get gunned down in the street the way we did, the way those 447s did in the last module. We saw how to use smoke. We saw how to use assault move. We saw how, if you're the Germans, they had a lot of hexes to cover and they could cover them because they were using the alternate hex grain. Should have had a chance to learn a lot of things there. I hope it worked for you. For further information, do what I did during the game stop and read the rules section. You need to re read sections A7 to 9 for all the in, in the uh, rule books. Now, when I say 2A9, I actually mean all of A9. So that's where you get all the machine gun items and the rest of it. And that's in the rule book for Advanced Squad Leader. Now, coming next session, you just had two sessions on fire lanes. Did you learn anything? If I quizzed you on it, could you pass? I bet you could. And you can now at least see how they work so you can practice. In the next module, then, we're going to get you fired up as we start taking tar target practices with multi-man counters using some squad weapons where you have to use indirect fire and direct fire. So in other words, our buddies the mortars and the bazookas are going to start showing up. Thanks a lot. Hope to see you again soon.